All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the weekly UK Sangha. Um, today we're here with um, some of our friends, uh, Veda, DJ, and Eric. Um, there was no questions or topics to mention, so um, I think I'll just jump right into the sutta I picked out for today. Today I'm reading the Majjhimanakaya 48. The Kasambian Sutta. And I think this is a good sutta to um, give kind of a realistic indicator of uh, progress on the path or progress in the Dhamma because it, it's pretty relevant to things we might experience and encounter within our interactions with other people in the world. So um, a lot of people say uh, one of the big biggest signals that they're making progress is that um, their, their wife or their family member um, noticed that there was a change in um, reactivity, there was a change in uh, their overall demeanor of that person. So. This is kind of what sh shows that um, you're making progress in meditation. Uh, alongside with the direct experience of uh, experiencing less uh, unnecessary dukkha and uh, mental proliferation. Um, how you react to others and how you train to react to others is probably where the rubber meets the road the most. So this is where um, triggers are triggered and um, habitual tendencies are activated the most. And this is where sati is needed the most. And this is where uh, this is where you need to remember the Dhamma. Um, OK, with that, I'll just jump right in. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Kasambi in Gosita's Park. Now on that occasion, the bhikkhus at Kasambi had taken to quarreling and brawling and were deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. They could neither convince each other nor be convinced by others. They could neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> I, has anyone ever experienced this? You know? Um, where you're in an argument with someone and uh, there's just no progress being made in that argument. You're not there. You're not convincing them of your side and they're not convincing you at all. And uh, it kind of uh, spirals out of control into the point where you're throwing verbal daggers at each other. Yeah, it's just name calling. There's not really anything of benefit, right? It, nothing's moving. It's just a standstill. Yeah. yeah, so um, that happens a lot, <laughs> um, and it's kind of useless. It's kind of fruitless um, at that point. When it gets to that point, it's more skillful to just leave the conversation. Um, someone's not going to be convinced, and uh, anger is arising in you. Uh, there's no fruit to come of that uh, quarrel, but... Um, I'll continue with the sutta. Then a certain bhikkhu went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and informed him of what was happening. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain bhikkhu thus, Come bhikkhu, tell those bhikkhus in my name that the teacher calls them. Yes, Venerable Sir, that he replied. And he went to those bhikkhus and told them, The teacher calls the Venerable Ones. Yes, friend, they replied, and they went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side. The Blessed One then asked them, Bhikkhus, is it true that you have taken to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, that you can neither convince each other nor be convinced by others, that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others? Yes, Venerable Sir. 
Bikus, what do you think? When you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, do you on that occasion maintain acts of loving kindness by body, speech, and mind in public and in private towards your companions in the holy life? No, venerable sir. So, Bikus, when you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. On that occasion, you do not maintain acts of loving kindness by body, speech, and mind in public and in private towards your companions in the holy life. Misguided men, what can you possibly know? What can you see that you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers? that you can neither convince each other nor be convinced by others, that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Misguided men, that will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, there are these six memorable qualities that create love and respect and conduce to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. What are the six? Here a bhikkhu maintains acts, bodily acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. So bodily acts of loving kindness. Um, anything you do with your body. So at that point, it's kind of gone down the line of uh, dependent origination. It started with a feeling, turned into a thought, turned into an intention. Then um, maybe it's something, maybe you say it, maybe you don't, and then it, you do it with your body. So um the body is kind of the last barrier to um, letting something get out. So when you actually commit an act of violence or you do something unloving with physically, um, you've kind of were asleep um, and you didn't catch it for so long that it became uh, it manifests uh, as a bodily act. And this is where people break laws and go to jail. So there's free speech, but once you do something violent with your body, then uh, the consequences just get uh, bigger. Um, okay, the next one. Again, a bhikkhu maintains verbal acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality that creates love, respect, and is conducive to unity. All right, so what are we actually letting out of our mouth? Is it coming from loving kindness? It's a good question to ask yourself. What is the what is the motive? What is the intention be behind this thing I'm saying to someone? Um a lot of times in our interactions with someone, it's coming out of um, some kind of hurt, some kind of triggered, some kind of uh, self-defense mode. Okay, you feel threatened. You feel you feel someone has um, hurt you, so you you, uh, you uh, respond, you react with vitriol and you spew mental flames out of your mouth. And uh, this is um, all a process that goes on very quick in the mind and comes out of the mouth. So it's, it's, uh, it requires a lot of reaction time to wake up to this kind of thing, okay? Coming from someone who has a little bit of a temper, a hot temper, um it i've gotten a lot better at reacting to uh when it's happening so in this heat of the it's one thing 
to be in a sangha call and be like, yeah, of course, don't say angry things, don't say unkind things. It's another thing when you're in the thick of battle, when you're in the world, when you're at work, when you're interacting with people. So um, how quick can you wake up to this kind of thing and realize this is not conducive to loving kindness and this is not conducive to uh, unification of mind. So this is not conducive to jhana. This is not conducive to um, pleasurable states and the deliverance from dukkha. So uh, realize that um, the sword, the, the daggers are two-sided. Um, it's a double-pointed dagger. You're stabbing yourself and other people at the same time. Um, and then we'll get to the next one. Uh, again, a bhikkhu maintains mental acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality that creates love and unity. Okay, so um, this is where it kind of starts, is the mental acts of loving kindness. So what's going on in your head? What is the verbal dialogue like? Is it loving? <laughs> Or is it angry? You know, is it resentful? Is it um, plotting its revenge? Is it thinking about people that you don't like? Um, inspiring angry feelings inside of you. Okay. This just leads to your own harm. It's not helping anything. <laughs> Throw out these thoughts at once as soon as you see them and think uh, thoughts of loving kindness. So you can, so you can just be uh, a happy person, and you can just let go, and you can just experience uh, more authentically fulfilling and satisfying states. Um, everyone wants, likes the experience of love and loving kindness, and uh, the idea is, or the truth is, that you can just experience these states just by a habit of practice. Uh, you don't need somebody to love. You can just experience loving kindness itself. Okay. You don't need to even conceptualize yourself that you're loving yourself or other people. You can just experience, you can just go straight to loving kindness um, and loving kindness for just whatever what is just whatever is going on or just the feeling of loving kindness itself. Um, you don't need to direct loving kindness towards uh, anyone in particular or yourself, although these can be tools, uh, intermediary tools. Um, but when you are experiencing uh, loving kindness in the absence of, in the absence of like a, a specific justification for that loving kindness, you can say that that loving kindness is a more uh, profound experience. So, loving kindness that ex that is experienced without boundary, without uh, direction, or you can say it goes in all directions. It doesn't have one direction; it goes in every direction. Um, it, in the suttas, it mentions the quadrants. So. My interpretation of that is actually um, the same as going from uh, fourth jhana to the boundless jhanas is just kind of another boundary dissolving experience. So you're experiencing loving kindness. So the actual sensation, the actual feeling of love um, in the up direction, <laughs> forward, behind you, left, right. So you're simultaneously experiencing love going in every single... So this is like a literal experience. It's not... It's it's actually an experience. Like it's a meditation. It's not in like a... It's not metaphorical or something like that. Um, yeah, so can you, ex can you radiate loving kindness in all directions? Like literally radiate it. <laughs> That's a... 
I think that's something that that uh, I guess there's many techniques to try to like get into that state of mind um, by trying to evoke the feeling first. But uh, I say it's a result of the sum total of your habitual uh, mental activity. And then you can strengthen it that way. So if your mental dialogue is continually loving and continually kind, um, you're just as a byproduct of that going to experience more feelings of love, um, compassion. And then this feels good. So it's like kind of like a, it's, uh, I don't want to say higher state of consciousness, but it's a um, more dukkha free state of consciousness. And uh, you can just kind of soak it in and soak it up and just kind of reside there satisfied. And you don't have to try to bring up the past or the future about, oh, I got to love myself and forgive my mistakes and bring up my past self and love that past self or bring up all beings of the universe. It's just kind of a direct experience. Like I don't, so I'm sitting here uh, experiencing this immediate experience. Um, I can I can imagine all beings of the universe, but that's kind of pointless. <laughs> What's the point? That here is good enough. Like you can just experience love here and now. Um, you don't need to um, bring up imaginary things that aren't there. So that's the whole idea of what the buddha taught is to stop imagining things um wake up to reality uh, okay i'm going to continue again apiku uses things in common with his virtuous companions in the holy life without making reservations he shares with them any gain of a kind that accords with the dhamma and has been attained in a way that accords with the Dhamma, including even the contents of his bowl. This is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and is conducive to unity. Again, a bhikkhu dwells both in public and in private, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life those virtues that are unbroken, untorn, unblotched, unmottled, liberated, commended by the wise, not misapprehended, and conducive to unification. This too is a memorable quality that creates love, respect, and conduces to unity. So um, the idea is that this is um, strengthening the meditation. So the the bodily verbal and mental acts of loving kindness is conducive to the actual process of meditation the process of jhana and the process of insight um there's kind of like a popular pragmatic dharma idea that um oh uh wisdom and compassion are com like separate separate axis of development um they're not really as separate as you might think they're kind of you know go hand in hand uh the more the more you maintain verbal mental and physical acts of loving kindness the more uh wisdom you will ex you will experience this is a, again this is similar to separating uh jhana and insights practice so saying you can just do dry vipassana and like that's going to work. It's not, that's not what the Buddha taught or like that's not what's in the canon, like the actual canon, not people's opinions about people's opinions. Okay. So uh, this might ruffle some feathers or like <laughs> it's somehow controversial, but this is like directly from the, the, the text. So it says conducive to concentration. I replaced unification there, but it says uh, a bhikkhu dwells both in public and in private, possessing 
in common with his companions in the holy life those virtues that are unbroken untorn unblotched unmodeled liberated commended by the wise not misapprehended and conducive to concentration so all of the different factors of the path um, work together and strengthen each other Again, a bhikkhu dwells both in public and in private, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life, that view that is noble and emancipating, and that leads one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering. This too is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. These are the six memorable qualities that create love and respect and conduce to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Of these memorable, memorable qualities, the highest, the most comprehensive, the most conclusive is this view that is noble and emancipating and leads the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering. Just as the highest, the most comprehensive, the most conclusive part of a pinnacle building is the pinnacle itself, so too of these six memorable qualities, the highest is the view that is noble and emancipating. So it's saying that on top of these, all of these qualities, um, these virtuous qualities, the highest quality is the noble right view. So that would be wisdom itself. So the highest wisdom. It's saying on top of all of these noble qualities is the highest wisdom. That's the pinnacle. That's the heights of the mountaintop. So it's directly saying here that the virtues go hand in hand with the wisdom. Um, I think enlightenment is often confused as to be something magical, some kind of thing that um, someone experiences one time and then uh, never does anything harmful again or never does anything evil again. Okay, that's kind of a superstitious view. Because the problem is that you can't know what the future holds. All you can know is right now, is what you're doing right now. What is, if it's right view right now? Okay, am I enlightened right now or not? Enlightenment uh, is now or never. So it's experience now or it's not. So because someone claims a past experience, and projects into the future that they're never going to do anything harmful again, that's a delusion. And someone who is enlightened doesn't project into the future what they cannot know. All they know is right now. So that's where the mistake comes in into um, labeling some person as enlightened and then believing that they're beyond corruption. Um, because of some experience they had or had at one time, um, you know, things always change and uh, you don't know what comes in the future. So enlightenment as a skill, as a skill that is continually used um, um, rather than a magical thing like, oh, what, this person seemed to be wise, but they're not um they did something unloving so uh, so then you 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 uh you build this idea of enlightenment that you project onto someone and when they don't meet that ideal you uh, become disenchanted with it i think that's the problem so um to not be fooled by these kinds of concepts of enlightenment and to see it as a direct experience. Yeah, go go ahead. 
you have a question? Just, uh, <clears throat> I just would want to add something because one of the qualities of the soda panna is that you have uh, complete confidence in the Dhamma. So one aspect of it would be the confidence in that you're never going to deviate from real Dhamma anymore especially from the school we are uh, we are practicing in so if you look at it from a confidence standpoint it would be absolutely possible to to make such a statement but you probably just wouldn't make such a statement right so that would be a delusional confidence i'm never going to do something how do you know no, no, no. that so no, no, let, no. Me, let me that's not what i said Oh, okay. But let me, yeah, yeah. In, in the here and now. Right. So that's the difference. That That's the point I'm trying to make. You're right. You're 100% right with the confidence. But the confidence is not concerned with something in the future that doesn't exist. It's concerned with right now. I really got it right now. I'm. There's no doubt about it right now that I have the, that the Dhamma that this is the path and this isn't the path. You wouldn't so think point. in that way. You wouldn't think in, in any way that projects into the future. Um, this moment, because you're in this moment. For it the doesn't so make sense. The whole concept, the whole concept of someone saying something like this and adding the, 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 the definition of enlightenment to it is a no brainer, so to speak. I would say that's more in the realm of the arhat for the sotapan. They still um, experience hindrances. They still experience some fetters and they still think into the future. The difference is with the confidence and with the destruction of doubt is there's no doubt in what is and isn't the path. So for the sotapan, when they are, when they wake up to the things that they're doing, um, it doesn't mean they still don't do them sometimes, but they know without a doubt this is not the path. So this is not the Dhamma. And when they do 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 the Dhamma and they experience the Dhamma and they experience the fruit of that wisdom, they know without a doubt this is the Dhamma. So it's that's interesting a, to see this fragmentedness even in the explanations and in, in, in the in the in the Sangha uh, accumulation of of enjoying the Dhamma. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't really understand that. Because this, this just, this just uh, shows the fragmentedness of the relationship between the different parts of the of the mind. If you're in one part of the mind that is enlightened, it, it's it's enlightened. And if you're in another part that's not totally connected to this part, it's it's still fragmented. You know. And from one fragment to the other fragment, it's it's still a still a shift in the in the in the in, in, in the modus operandi, so to so. speak. Yeah, there there can be different um, there can be different parts of ourselves that get it and parts of ourselves that don't get it. But um, it, it the internal family system, so um. There can be sort of the intellectual wisdom of something, but not the felt wisdom of it. And there, and the opposite can be true. You can have the felt wisdom of it without intellectually understanding it. So um, yes, there is different parts of our this. You know, there's no self here. It's really just parts and pieces working together. So different parts and different pieces have different aspects um, and different different levels of. Uh, uh, if you want to say levels of enlightenment, sure, but awakeness, enlightenment, awake, whatever. Awakeness. Um, um, but the trick is here to become a, a, awake to that, to awake to the different parts and pieces. So realizing that, yeah, there's different parts of me that are constantly changing, constantly feeling up and down this way and that way. And none of it's really me because it's just a bunch of parts and pieces. Like there's no, there's no self there. It's just, 
um, constituent parts that are impermanent and interrelated and interdependent. Um, like all, yeah. that, that's also an interesting part of the whole polishing the table thing. On, on one side, it's getting uh, 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 dirty again, and on the other side, it's completely polished. It's not. It's not the. It's not the table itself. It's the process of polishing it, being able to just immediately throw all the the garbage <clears throat> out, so to say. Yeah, and being able to catch it quicker too. So, um, to think that you polish your table once and then it's never going to need to be polished again is kind of the thing I was talking about the magical view of enlightenment. Rather than you become really good at polishing and you can notice little dust pieces with a greater amount of clarity than you could before. So, you can polish that right away. Um, and so, your table from the outside looking in, looks polished all the time and looks really polished because you're a really good polisher, not because you polished it once and never need to polish it. Um, so that's a good point um, you bring up with the table. Um, uh, if there's nothing else, I'll continue. Of these memorable qualities, let's see, where was I? Yeah, so the pinnacle pinnacle is the noble view then the that is emancipated and how does this view that is noble and emancipating lead the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering here a bhikkhu gone to the forest or to the root of it or of a tree or an empty hut considers thus is there any obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know or see things as they actually are? If a bhikkhu is obsessed by sensual lust, then his mind is obsessed. So I'm sure as young men, we've all been here before. Um, a main thing about sensual lust is the obsessive loss the obsessiveness of the mind that goes along with it. So all the mental proliferation that goes along with sensual lust is what kind of perpetuates it. Um, I don't know if you see a girl that you find you fancy in public, go ask, go talk to her or don't talk to her, but stop thinking about her when she's not there. So it, the thing is, it's not saying don't, you know, don't, uh, especially for lay people, it's not saying don't uh, don't engage in anything sensual or sexual. It's just saying that is my what is my mind doing? Is it obsessing over something so that I cannot see things as they are now? Am I obsessing over a past interaction or a future interaction instead of being in the moment? Okay, you see the girl, you talk to her, you don't. The, no mental proliferation. Just do it or don't do it or don't do it. And that that is, a, I think, a better way to go about things. Um, don't imagine something that you can lust for in your imagination. OK, just experience things directly. Um, if a bhikkhu, then his mind is obsessed. If a bhikkhu is obsessed by ill will, then his mind is obsessed. If if he is obsessed by sloth and torpor, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed by rest, restlessness and remorse, then his mind is obsessed. <clears throat> if he is obsessed by doubt, then his mind is obsessed. If a bhikkhu is absorbed in speculation about this world, then his mind is obsessed. If a bhikkhu is absorbed in speculation about the other world, then the mind is obsessed. If a bhikkhu takes to quarreling and brawling and is deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, then his mind is obsessed. He understands thus, there is no obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot see things as they actually are. My mind is well disposed for awakening to the truths. 
This is the first knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus. When I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, do I obtain internal serenity? Do I personally obtain stillness? He understands thus. When I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, I obtain internal serenity. I obtain stillness. This is the second knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus. Is there any other recluse or Brahmin outside the Buddhist dispensation possessed of a view such as I possess? He understands thus. There is no other recluse or Brahmin outside the Buddha's dispensation possessed of a view such as I possess. This is the third knowledge attained by him that is noble, super, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although he may commit some kind of offense for which a means of rehab rehabilitation has been laid down, still he at once confesses, reveals, and di discloses it to the teacher or to wise companions in the holy life. And having done that, he enters upon restraint for the future. Just as a young tender infant lying prone at once draws back when he puts his hand or his foot on a live coal, so too, that is the character of a person who possesses right view. So yeah, this is a this is an important shift. Um, it's that when you start doing things that are not in line with the Dhamma, you it's like putting your hand on the fire immediately you taste the comma of it you taste the ripening of that comma and you realize this this is harming me so you react you take your hand out of the fire in ignorance you let that your hands sit there a little longer and burn a little more and maybe it's not so bad right but uh the more you wake up to these kinds of things it doesn't mean you will never make mistakes it just means uh, when you make a mistake, uh, you're more aware of making that mistake so that you restrain from doing it in the future. You learn from burning yourself. And you understand that you are burning yourself. He understands thus, I possess the character of a per person who possesses right view. This is the fourth knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble, noble disciple. <coughs> Sorry, tripping up on my words. Again, a noble disciple considers thus: Do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view, although he may be active in various matters for his companions in the holy life yet he has a keen regard for the training in higher virtue training in higher mind and training in higher wisdom just as a cow with a new calf while she grazes watches her calf so too that is the character of a person who possesses right view he considers thus I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. This is the fifth knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, he heeds it, gives it attention, engages with it, with all his mind, hears the Dhamma as with eager 
ears. He understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the sixth knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, he gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains gladness connected with the Dhamma. He understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the seventh knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, he has well sought the character for realization of the fruit of stream entry. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, he possesses the fruit of stream entry. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Right, so if you guys are considering pondering stream entry, this is the sutta for you to do that. Um, all of these qualities are aspects of stream entry, and these inquiries are useful to ask yourself these kinds of questions. If you're considering, am I in stream entry or am I not? Um, yeah, so one of the biggest things, you know, uh, when the Dhamma and discipline is being proclaimed, there is kind of an inspiration in the Dhamma. There is, uh, you get the meaning of it. You understand it to the core. Uh, rather than it simply being some kind of a security blanket for you, you really get this stuff. You really understand, damn, this is... This is true. <laughs> this is a. This is the way to the destruction of uh, suffering. So there's a sort of altogether altogether new level of profundity to the teaching of the Dhamma and to the listening of the Dhamma and the gladness connected with the Dhamma. Um, yeah. So that's the end of the Sita. If anyone has anything they'd like to say. But yeah, so at the end, kind of going into a new sort of appreciation for it, where you can actually understand what it means as you said, opposed to like a security band blanket where you just throw it on and listen to it and you're like, oh, you know, this is comfy because of aesthetics. You can kind of penetrate to the core and be like, OK, this knowledge, the recollection of this knowledge coming back to this is actually liberating. Right. Yeah, good point. So um, I think that's the main transition from, um, I don't know, just putting it on to um, distract yourself from something you're kind of completely engaged with it listening to it attentively because you see the value of it so that's a marker for stream entry for sure and it gladdens your mind so there is a gladness that comes from it a super mundane uh, a super mundane level of happiness that comes from it that's not that's not of the world it has nothing to do with um, the acquisition of anything or the or the or the satisfaction of uh, sensual desires or um, it has nothing to do with with uh, with social status or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, it's like a subtraction process of getting rid of all the stuff that you didn't need to hold on to anymore, and what a relief that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's not for the goal isn't seen to be like, OK, you know what? 
I got to get this enlightenment thing. So that person that I saw that I'm super attracted to just for like five seconds there and now wrote an entire story about how we're going to get married. If I'm enlightened, they're going to fall for me. Right. Uh, so like that kind of thought process yeah. or if I do this, it'll get me sports cars or whatever. I'll get a lot of esteem, you know, that that sort of jazz or just because people will think it, I'm cool. You know what I mean? There's that aspect, too, of just like, oh, if you right. talk super wise and all that stuff, people will think you're cool. And yeah. if that's in the mind, then it's like that's going to kind of reduce yeah. the security of the satisfaction and all that jazz. So, yeah, it's the right. It's not the right view. It's not the right intention um that's going to go nowhere fast okay it's not going to lead you to um what you are really searching for here uh, that is really liberating so yeah um trying to meditate to increase your profits at google or something <laughs> not going to lead you to the destruction of craving <laughs> yeah but uh um kudos to them but uh <laughs> Yeah, and it's not going to, it's not so you can try to get laid or something. Like, I mean, I don't, I think these are two different endeavors, but yeah, <laughs> um, I don't see a problem with, um, I think like I don't see a problem with either one, but like, again, like the motive has to be pure, is what I'm saying. Yeah, the motive for the Dhamma, the motive for the meditation has to be the right motive. Mm -hmm. That's, completely pure of any you know the mind will play all kinds of games and all kinds of tricks of like wanting to get something out of it but the idea is that you're just getting rid of stuff so if you have the idea of trying to get something out of it then it's the wrong idea to begin with and there won't be any progress there won't yeah. be an iota of wisdom that that will come of it and there will be in, no fruit um yeah I think coming back to that whole sort of subtractive process is helpful. So we can talk about things in perhaps the positive way with like satisfaction and all that stuff. And um, that can be helpful. But it's really secure when you come back to that sort of negative or a subtracting process, right? Because it's like there's nothing to like grasp onto. Because I think even as like one practices or whatever, you know, there can be kind of a change, right? You you can go from very um, elated, like sort of um, rapturous states or just, you know, on different sort of degrees and then it can kind of calm down. And if you can't accept the calming down for a while, you know, and you start to crave those other states, not that you've trained yourself to be able to get into uh, a feeling of success of, you know, that champion, like, yes, we can do this, but more just like you're now craving that because, you know, a couple of days ago, everything was peachy in that regard but now it's more kind of quieting down right and so can you accept that quietness and come to the stillness and be chill with that right and then if it kind of you know so be able to ride that wave a little bit in terms of happiness and all the different flavors it might entail yeah um it's it's funny you mentioned that uh there's a uh, there's like another sutta that i was thinking about reading too that talks about this it's called uh the true man and uh i'll jump to just the part that's relevant here and uh and it's called the the true man but uh for all the woke uh liberals please don't uh don't get mad don't get mad good if you want to take the mobs uh go to biku bodhi he's the one who uh <laughs> translated the original polycan uh so one second here let me just go to beginning and i think it was like let's see i think it's in the one 113 so page 909 909 Uh, okay. Give it a sec, it's loading. Okay. So the true man, it, it talks about um, people who 
uh, think of themselves as better than other people, being the untrue man. So if you came from an aristocratic family to the holy life, you think of yourself as better than people who came from uh, lower classes. Um, that would be a untrue man because it has nothing to do with the destruction of craving or the realization of the Dhamma and uh, even the jhanas. So it gets, it starts off with that and then it, and then it mentions some other stuff. But uh, so, um, um, moreover, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. He considers thus, I have gained the attainment of first jhana, but these other bhikkhus have not gained the attainment of first jhana. So he lauds himself and disparages others because of his attainment of the first jhana. This too is the characteristic of an untrue man. But a true man considers thus non-identification, even with the attainment of the first jhana, has been declared by the Blessed One. For in whatever way they conceive, the fact is ever other than that. So putting non-identification first, he neither lauds himself nor disparages others because of his attainment of first jhana. This too is the character of a true man. All right, so it's pretty important. Um, the the specifically line that that uh, strikes me as really important or relevant is. Uh, Um, for for in whatever way they conceive, the fact is ever other than that. So whatever you're conceiving of first first jhana to be, or of your attainment of first jhana, it the fact of the matter is not the way you conceive of it. So it's not what you think it is. Um, your conception of first jhana is not first jhana. It's something else. So to realize that the the mind's limitation here, that it cannot conceive of these things, it can just be experienced. You're either experiencing first jhana, and that's the knowledge of it, or not. Um, there's no conceiving of it after the fact, or even during it. If you try to conceptualize it, it's not it. The conceptualization of it isn't the direct um, substance of it of what's going on um, um and then it does this for all the jhanas and then it goes down to all the way to um neither perception nor non-perception and then saying how the untrue man disparages others because they didn't attain it um and then the true man practices non-identification with those attainments. And uh, finally, it gets to, um, moreover, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, true man enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling, and his taints are destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. This bhikkhu does not conceive anything. He does not conceive in regard to anything. He does not conceive in any way. So um, at the end of each jhana, it's saying his conceiving of it is not it. And then finally, all the way to um, the cessation um, experience of Nibbana, there's no conceiving anymore there. It's just, it is what it is. Um, the conceptualization is over and uh, that's the only truly fulfilling state to be in because even amidst every jhana, there's still going to be that part of yourself that's uh, coming in and out of satisfaction and uh, not 
it still realizes that this jhana is not like absolutely satisfying. It's even the jhana is unsatisfactory, even though it's much better than not being in jhana. And it's the way out. So following the path of jhana is the way out. But realizing that it's not self, to not identify with it, to not cling to it as uh, something that's permanently satisfying. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think because like if there's too much of a conception of it and what it is, then you attach to that idea. And then next time when maybe the sense like, again, you can have similar sensations in terms of maybe again, there's that pity, there's a sukha, though sometimes that's not even so much sensations in that same sort of way in terms of like what's happening with the body feeling structure or whatever. But you can kind of accept the changes. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be so stuck. And you can just enjoy what is happening here and now as opposed to like, oh boy, it's got to be flashing lights. If it's not flashing lights, that ain't it, baby. And I'm, it's, it's awful, right? So, yeah, so yeah. Pitsuka, um aren't, they change a lot. Like yeah. the way PT, PT can be experienced in many ways. And so can Suka. Yeah. So it's not... A permanent experience of um, that's what PT is always like, or that's what Suka is always like. So the the important thing here is to just continue the main practice of right view, the main practice of the Dhamma, and uh, gliding the mind with the Dhamma. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the PT and Suka will come. It's a it's a byproduct of uh, correct practice and right view. Um, yeah, so I'd say. Practice, um, practice the end of the path in the beginning of the path. So stop conceptualizing things. Um, practice stopping conceptualizing things. Um, uh, that's kind of how to get there. Um, it's not going to happen magically. Um, so that's the idea is that um, enlightenment is a skill um, to be developed by practicing being enlightened and realizing that you can do it for yourself. Because in uh, many suttas, the Buddhas will give um, a shortened, condensed version of the Dhamma to, for example, Bahiya, and he says, train thus in the scene, the only the scene. And when you've trained that, it will really, when it will really be like that, that is the end of dissatisfaction. So he, sim he says, like, train it being that way, practice it being that way, until it really is that way. So that's kind of like the way to do it here. Um, and the confidence to do that. So uh, I think uh, that's going to be the way to um, the most results is to actually practice what your what the end goal or the end fruition of the practice is practice have being there practice already having that experience um if i find myself uh mentally proliferating i realize that this mental proliferation is causing me suffering and uh stop mentally proliferating and practice that way but the idea is that unless you're completely enlightened like there's going to be some mental proliferation there or if it's not there then you're experiencing uh, a more sublime state of consciousness but the idea is that um, practice the end goal in the here and now um, is the way to get there actually get there uh, so i that's that's all i have to say veda do you have any uh Parting words. Thank you very much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for coming, man. Uh, I think there may be uh, some confusion in the time, so thanks for bringing that up. But yeah, uh, thank you guys for coming. You're as useful to me as whatever use you gain from me. Uh, you guys are equally as useful to me um, for practicing the Dhamma. Um, so I think it's good to continue to get together with other people and
talk about it and practice it together because I think that's the that's the way that um, inspires the most um, zeal to practice because for example if you're if you're playing a game with your buddies you want to get better to beat your friends right and if you weren't getting together once a week and p playing in a certain game you wouldn't practice to get better at that game right you would just be like complacent because there's no there's nobody to practice with and there's nobody to um, ping pong off each other so that's the that's the importance of sangha that is missing in a lot of people's practices. You actually need sangha. You need that for that sense of community to keep you um, keep the sati going and keep remembering. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. I would say like definitely because like in kind of the ordinary world, like these kinds of like ways of looking at things can be fairly rare sometimes and so coming back to that support can be really helpful yeah because you're you're told you know <laughs> you've got to do this you got to do that in order to be happy and so when you're around people who recognize that no this is the path that leads to happiness or the method it's it's very yeah it adds to that sort of zeal that confidence that yeah this is this is how you do it this is good stuff yeah um yeah, I just you you start to realize that uh, there's the things that you thought were going to bring you satisfaction don't really work, and the things that are simple and the things that are have to do with the Dhamma is actually um, satisfying uh, in a kind of way that you won't really find anywhere else. <laughs> That's an aspect of stream entry. Mm. So. Uh, um, Again, thank you guys for coming and YouTube. Uh, anyone can join these calls. I think uh, there is a miscommunication with the time, so I'll either change it in the info or start doing it an hour earlier. Um, but again, thank you everyone and uh, take care and peace be with you. Amen. <laughs> Sadu. Sadu. <laughs>